empowering. Let me put the, I got it. And then they, they access the episode in a way that is titrated. So this is very unique about GTAP, which is a Google search. So the client is invited, the group is invited to do a Google search throughout the episode and finds what we call a POD, which is a point of disturbance. So that's another piece I absolutely love about this group protocol, which is the accessing of the traumatic episode is done in a titrated manner. You take one little nugget, one little piece, one point of disturbance, and then you're gonna process that point of disturbance. And then you do another Google search and another Google search, and you, you process it in little segments. So the adaptation to children though, has, I developed three different tracks. They're a lot of fun. The first track with CG tab, um, <clears throat> hold on. The first track is um, you use the a workbook that I created is a, a 79 page workbook is the journey of the butterfly. And so it's really beautiful because the worksheet actually is a butterfly. And so the child um, travels through a butterfly and I think I can show it to you right here. Let me uh, share my desktop real quick. <clears throat> so this, this is the worksheet of, of the group protocol. So the child is going to again to enter that journey with the butterfly through safety and through the four elements, they go through the beginning of that yucky thing that happened and they identify positive memory, good thoughts and empower meta perceptions. And as they enter the body of the butterfly, they identify those little points of disturbance and you know, sorting out spots. And we begin the, the processing. So with the workbook of the journey of the butterfly, they they dive through, you know, the 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 episode. And then um, you know, they accompany each other, which I think is really beautiful to witness with groups. The other track is um my latest obsession, which is EMDR on the ground. And what we do basically is to create the butterfly on the ground. And let me see if I, I find a little um, video for you to see. But basically, um, we capitalize on embodiment and movement. And with that, the child's gonna be using mostly marching. And they will march and they stand on the butterfly, which makes it you know a lot of fun um, if I find it later on, I'll show it to you. So they are standing up, they're moving, they're doing bilateral dance. So for children that have difficulty with attention or children that have a hard time with engagement, I think the, the CG tap on the ground is probably one of the best options. In addition to that, you can really scale up because you can have so many children, like in cases of earthquakes or um, <clears throat> shootings, and you have a lot of children, you can work with the school and you can just allocate a large space to do the CG tab and then have the butterflies. And of course, you're going to need facilitators and you know therapists that can support each of the groups. And then the third track is CG tab using the sand tray. I absolutely love sand tray. You probably, some of you already know. And so we utilize CG type in the sand tray for that each child will have to have their own sand tray. And instead of <clears throat> drawing, we're gonna physicalize and represent what is emerging uh, through throughout the protocol. So really uh, a nice way to diversify and also you know, bring the children that may not need the comprehensive resource-rich treatment 
and 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 have those children that maybe just by doing group work is enough. On it, that's amazing. I think about like even the power of doing it all together all together as a group. It's really um like convenient. You can help a lot of children all at once, but just being with other kids is probably pretty powerful as well. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one that's struggling in this. Right. Yeah. The companionship. And even they, even though they don't share their verbal narratives yeah. connected to the trauma, there's still a great deal of companionship. And so yeah. it is really beautiful to witness. And the other piece um, that I wanted to share with you, you know, I truly believe in the power of systemic EMDR therapy. Yeah. And throughout my years as a therapist, as an EMDR therapist, what I've seen is that a lot of our children present with symptoms that are really the result of intergenerational trauma. And what we see is the transmission of generational wounds. And, and it's the child who's really bringing the symptom into the surface. Yeah. And I really have advocated for so many years about the need for a systemic approach to EMDR when we work with children. So in this case, if we incorporate group work, then mm -hmm. parents can also have their own track. So they can get the GPEP, which is a group for parents and uh, power, uh, parents empowering protocol, where um, the GPEP and the parenting will are used together. So they learn about core regulation, mirroring, connecting to that bigger, well, older, wiser self. And then th when they do the GPEP, which is very much based on GTEP, mm -hmm. then parents can utilize the resources. They can <clears throat> develop their own companions, their own support, and then envision the future where they are being able to be that bigger, older, you know, companion be the co-regulator, be the co-organizer of experience. And, and it's just a beautiful protocol. And that protocol can be accompanied by GTEP, where mm -hmm. they can actually process. So they, they can process episodes connected with parenting. They can process triggering moments and activation with the child, because the truth of the matter is that even babies, as beautiful as they are, yeah. They, they can trigger the parent, the daily routine. There are studies that show that the daily routine can activate a parent's post-traumatic stress disorder and activate their own traumas and move the parent out of co-regulation into defense, into self-preservation, into survival. Wow, the, the power, the magnitude that that could have, like healing so many people at once um, with the intergenerational trauma could change the trajectory of entire cultures. I mean, at a minimum, like communities. Absolutely, yes. And I know that most of us child therapists, we struggle with how can we work with parents, right? Mm -hmm. And how do we work with parents within an EMDR um, framework? And so the group um, begins for, I mean, for some that will be enough, but for parents that need more intensive treatment, it begins to normalize the process. Because one of the things that we see <laughs> is that when we mention to parents therapy, um, it activates their shame. And what they hear is, um, you're telling me I'm not a good enough parent. I'm not doing a good job. It's my fault. But with, with the group work, it begins to normalize the fact that we all need some work. We all have some issues that we need to heal. And then if you have parents that need a more comprehensive treatment, then after they have finished and completed some of the group work, then they can continue intensive standard um, EMDR treatment. Yeah, they don't feel so singled out, like I'm I'm the problem, it's more kind of normalized. So as far as like the training to be trained in this, what does it entail? Like how long is a training? And, and right after the training, can we then go to practice it? Or what does it take to be able to do this? And so this is the training is for EMDR clinicians. And so all of you here are already trained in EMDR. So you're eligible to 
um, to, to be trained in, in this group protocols. Each of the protocols, you know, is just one day. Um, I usually do the trainings in three days. The people are immersed in, in group protocols. And I think, you know, they capture truly the energy when you are three days completely immersed in, in the MDR group protocols. We usually begin with GTAP. So that way people get the foundation, the, the procedural steps, and then it's easier for them to see what was modified in CGTAP. Because in CGTAP, I also added uh, some additional resources, like a relational resource that is different from GTAP. Um, I also added a container, which um, GTAP doesn't have. And so we began with GTAP where people learn the theory, but there is a lot of practice. So they actually practice running the group. So by the time you're done at the end of the day, uh, you're pretty much ready to begin using GTAP. You receive a lot of support, a lot of material before the training videos that you need to watch and lots of material that you need to download, worksheets, manual, that initially will support you in just, you know, giving you the, the exact things that you have to say. For CG tab, then the second day, again, is one full day where you receive the theory, you watch videos, you see how it's done, and then you're gonna practice. You also receive the workbook, the 79 page illustrated workbook. You receive the worksheets in a format that you can reprint and reuse. You receive also a whole little booklet on the container protocol. And then for the third day, uh, the GPAB protocol, again, is one day where you get all the theory and then you get to practice and then you get a whole workbook, an extensive workbook on the parenting wheel, where we use a lot of metaphors. So the thermostat for the co-regulator, the dresser for the co-organizer of experience. So working with the whole brain, working with verbal narratives and teaching parents about this important concept, but also engaging the right brain, lots of metaphors, examples, and role plays. And then you get the, the worksheets for GPAP. You get the whole manual for GPAP that guides you step-by-step step in utilizing the protocol. That's also one full day. Wow. So, so able to do it with adult, really any age at that point. And um, I think about like even the concept of the PODs, the points of disturbance, it really seems um, safe, like contained digestible it's not like everything all at once absolutely that's one of the things I love two things I appreciate about this group protocols one is um that it has built-in resources yeah. lots of resources you have the four elements you have a positive memory which is accessing an adaptive network you have positive and empowering meta perceptions and positive beliefs and then um, you do the process in a way that is titrated. You do the Google search, you find a little point of disturbance, a nugget, and then you process that. The idea, one thing that I wanna emphasize about, especially GTEP and CGTEP, is that, again, it's not designed to create huge waves and activation is a low intensity protocol. It's not designed to do that, even though, again, we're pretty diverse. So some people, you may have someone that gets highly activated. It's not designed to do that. It's a low intensity protocol. The purpose and the goal is not to arrive to a sense of zero, but to reduce the level of disturbance. And with that, um, stabilize. So, so it's a protocol that can be used for stabilization uh, even before going into processing. So it has multiple uses. You know, it can be used with refugees. It can be used in mental health uh, community, uh, community mental health agencies, 
where you have groups. So it, it is applicable as you, you can use it in so many different uh, settings. I think about like even like school-based therapists or people that go into the schools um, if a peer um, commits suicide or um, there's so many applications and certainly the natural disasters too. Oh, I love the butterfly oh. too. That's like the prettiest, like, <laughs> I, I'm trying to picture on it. Is the, where you, the butterflies on the floor, is it like a mat, like a, a floor mat they step on or what does that actually look like? So there are multiple ways of doing this. So if you're going to scale up and let's say you had a shooting at school and of course all the children are highly traumatized, then the butterfly on the ground and EMD on the ground can be really powerful and you just need a large <clears throat> room and chalk. Um, if you're going to do it um, with let's say carpet you probably have to use to create the butterfly or to do a, create a square or a rectangle uh, you're going to have to use painting uh, tape because if you use paper and the, the idea is that the child can jump and be inside the butterfly which is an incredible feeling when you are inside the butterfly uh, you you know they can slip so I wouldn't recommend that but if you have the the tape that you use when you're painting mm -hmm. uh, on the floor is a little bit expensive it's the only downside but you can create a whole rectangle because we also have neutral um the neutral worksheet for children that don't like butterflies okay. or that are afraid of butterflies, they don't like them. Ah. We have also a neutral sheet and that can be created on the floor because the idea is that they jump, they do the bilateral dance, they march inside the butterfly. That's so brilliant because movement too. I didn't even think about that. Like it could be somebody's phobia, like or it could be related to their trauma. Okay, so I know we're we're on limited time, but there's a few questions, Anna. Is it appropriate for as young as three and four year olds? Is what Joanna uh, Voss is asking. Well, so the butterfly journey is appropriate for I would say five and up, four or five okay. and up. So if we're working with five-year-olds, for instance, and even if we do it online, because it can be done online as well, um, you have the parents there. If you have young children, then you can do it, but you have to have the parents supporting the four-year-old and doing the, you know, marching or the butterfly hug or the gorilla dance. So it can be beautiful also to have one parent accompanying each child. So it is doable but then you need additional helpers and companionship. Oh, I love it. Such opportunity for attunement too. I bet that's like to watch it and experience it as the clinician must be pretty powerful just to, just to have like that collective so many kids. So Nada says, um, I think of children in Puerto Rico who have been through hurricanes and earthquakes and no Turkey. I mean, there's so many um, big disasters um, at, in the same year. So it's, is natural disasters one of the most common applications or I guess it can be anything? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, last year, we did a large training, humanitarian training for Ukrainian therapists. And also we have trained therapists in multiple countries around, including Russia, mm -hmm. Poland, Germany, many countries around that are now helping Ukrainian children. We are about to just schedule yesterday the CGTEP for Turkey. So we're going to be providing again another humanitarian training for clinicians in Turkey to work with children impacted, which are all, you know, even if you were not in the earthquake site per se, just the news, just knowing that so many people died. So, you know, Turkey is really creating an incredible infrastructure and we're going to provide also the, the CG type uh, training for them. So when situations with refugees um, were uh, natural disasters, absolutely. 
Yeah, group protocols are probably one of the best ways to address to, you know, for early intervention. Okay, I love it. So um, anyone interested, you could go to a gay institute. Um, is it all online or is it in person or do you have several different options for the training? Right now, right now we're doing it online. Okay. So later on, we, we will do it in person. But for now, we're doing this online. And that way, many people, people from so many different countries can attend. And the first day when we do GTAB, we're going to have also Elon uh, be part of the training. So that's going to be fun to co-train co -train with, with Elon as well. Yeah. Yes, he's the creator of it all. That's amazing. You're literally changing the world with this. I even think about like... Um, it makes me kind of emotional to think about, like, I remember during COVID, you were like giving out like um, free SUD, like the rating scales, um, just to be able to help everyone. It's like when there's crisis, you show up with these magnificent things. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, like helping us to do the hard work, like worldwide. Um, okay, so there's one more question, actually, to um, when's the next training and price? So that would be on your website, I'm guessing. Yeah, okay. we're about to put some dates and announce um, the the new dates for for the GTEP. If you are not in you know, part of our email list, then send us an email so that way you receive the announcements. Okay. And then I know that you're also always so good at helping us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I know that when I post on Facebook, you 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 immediately uh, forward it yeah. to your groups. Yeah, like soon as soon as I see it to try to get this available to everyone uh, so they know. Now there's more than this that you teach on, like you have bundles. So there's on that site you can find more than CTEP, right? Like you can find like um, you have like a sand tray certificate. You have like a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, I have a busy mind. Okay. <laughs> I have only one body, but a very busy, busy mind. I was telling my husband yesterday with the last three years, I was like, oh my gosh, I never sat down to look at all the things that I that I did the last three years. But yes, I have a lot of trainings, um, intensives, which definitely are my favorites because people really get to capture the essence of, of EMDR practice and their intensives one and, and I wish I could stay I'm going to try to stay because I love sand tray and EMDR but one is actually the combination of EMDR and sand tray that's an intensive uh, another one is just EMDR um, specialist which really lays the foundation for clinicians to use EMDR therapy with children the second one is the systemic use of EMDR therapy. So parent, child, and attachment specialist. And mm -hmm. there is another one, a very, very complex trauma. So how to work with complex trauma and dissociation. Those are all intensives. But I also have master classes. You know, I told you I have a busy yeah. mind. So you do. <laughs> a lot of possibilities. Yeah. You could like literally like go on for like an unlimited amount of time just talking about all the work that you've done. I think about like the first um, a way that I found you was through your book. So your book is fantastic too. So the one on dissociation. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank <laughs> you, Ron. Can I want to announce that? So I finished the EMDR Santre book. Um, which oh. is going to be pretty extensive, but specifically with complex trauma and dissociations. So, so I hope to have it um, sometime this year, or next year out. Finally, it's been the work of twenty-two years of wow. combining the two, and now writing the book. So, I'm I'm so excited. That's my baby. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have chills just thinking about it, but you spoke at our recent playful EMDR um, summit and you had uh, some of your clinical examples and some directives and stuff like really um, healing some attachment ruptures with it. Fascinating. Okay. So when that book comes out, yeah, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you so much, Anna. And um, if uh, there's just one, and let's see, somebody said the best news ever. Um, when you explain the steps of the class, you can find it all on our website, a Gate Institute. And dissociation training, um, does it include 
teens. Does that include teens or dissociation training? But they're you know, young te- teens, I will say. Okay. However, I would say that 80% of the case conceptualization, 80% of the strategies and the intentional moment-to-moment decision-making applies to teenagers as well. So is focus on children, um, 12 and under, but certainly is applicable to all. Now, the Santra and the MDR, is for um, people, clients from all ages, including adults, with a, an extra focus on children. Okay, excellent. Yes, it works with adults so well as 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 with kids. All right, thank you, Anna. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right, same so. here. <laughs> Bye. 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 Um, okay, so Waldo. I'm going to pin you. Waldo is someone, oh my goodness, I love, love, love your background. Waldo is someone that I met um, a few years ago in a training, um, and he's also a fellow kind of enthusiast for EMDR and San Trey um, right there in New Mexico. Is that right, Waldo? That is correct. I got a chance to meet him in person and he's, he's tall and I'm short. And I was like, right, am I shorter than you imagined? <laughs> he's like, am I, am I taller than you imagined? But he's definitely um, one of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to sand tray. Um, you trained under, is it like. Dar- uh, Dr. Teresa Kessley. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop talking and let you talk. Walter. <laughs> Well, okay. So first off, I must acknowledge that um, you asked me to speak about San Trey on Anna Gomez Day. So just to put the pressure on me just a little bit. <laughs> oh, she's amazing. Isn't she? she is amazing. <laughs> um, and my daughter pointed this out with the camera that we're using. It looks like a background, but we're actually in a San Trey room. So that's not a background. It is a San Trey room. It's one of the smallest that we have in this building, um, the largest of which has five trays in it. And I don't even know how many figures. So, which is going to be great. It does look like a background. In fact, if it was, it would be pretty cool how you could pretend to pull things out, but it's really a background. Can, Can you describe like the setup of your practice and how you integrate, um, I know Santra is the basis, right? And then the EMDR is really applied in in specific cases? Right. So throughout our agency, it's it's interesting that you put it that way. Um, I don't remember if it was Anne, Annie, you, or actually Anna, who said when you were in Florida about, are you a play therapist who uses EMDR? Or are you an EMDR therapist who uses play. And that that really kind of struck me because the question to me felt like, is this something that you're just putting in like patchwork or is this something that's core to what you do? And I'm really seeing with what Anna's doing, with what you're doing, that it's, it's not just, oh, put it in where it fits. They're integrated throughout. And for our practice, that's how EMDR is. You know, as as we're doing a client-centered approach at the beginning of treatment, we're also integrating the very beginning of phase one and phase two. So from the beginning, we're already establishing the idea of a BLS. We're already establishing the idea of a container. We're already establishing from the beginning a body scan. Say, like, oh, what are you feeling right now? And generating that feeling language so the children can actually give that back to us, generating that awareness and the skill to be able to just be introspective. Oh, I love it. I love it. Now, Waldo, some people on here may not be familiar with sand trait therapy. Would you mm-hmm. um, be up for describing that? For sure. And I even have a sand tray with us. So let me go ahead and pull that up. 
I love how in your rooms too, you have, um, you know, the light bars and the, the electronics as well as you do some natural. Oh, wow. We oh, sure that's do. like another camera. Yep. So we got a couple angles. So, so we we went all out for today. <laughs> um, well, this is exciting. Okay. So one of the things that we believe is that the sand tray itself is sacred. So when somebody's working in the tray, we have certain rules that we follow. Rule number one, if this was my tray and I was working in here, then of course I can do whatever I need to. But for the therapist, hands off, right? Because that's an intrusion into possibly their psyche coming to the surface. Okay, so no and therapist really, hands in the tray at all. Now, especially when the person's working. Okay. Right. And then another thing that we do, and this is one that I think most people understand, is we don't try to label or name or try to give purpose to anything in the tray. So for instance, if you have a client and they put a figure similar to this in the tray, your own background, your own meaning, and your own experiences will give a purpose to it rather than whatever the purpose is for the client. And one of the warnings that I'll give uh, clinicians is that just because today or for the first five minutes, this figure right here might represent a devil, at another moment, that devil might actually be the hero. So we need to really be in the moment and in mm -hmm. tune with that client as they're going through the process. Oh, so it's not like set, like once they say it, um, you know, identify it and label it, that's not what it is um, throughout, like for sure. I mean, it might stay that way, but not, we Correct. can't assume that. And, you know, and that's one of the things I think that's really integrate, really important, like to play therapy and play therapist is we spend so much time being, trying to be, trying to be, right? Attuned to the client, to the child, to the person who's doing the work. So being able to evoke those other parts of them, to bring those to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about the sand medium also is that we try to be really aware oh, wow. of, of the imagery. We try mm -hmm. to be really aware, same as an EMDR, of those memory networks, those memory chains. Yeah. And as you're looking at it, you're seeing the visual, being, to be, being able to be attuned to the emotional side yeah. as well as the physical. Mm -hmm. Wow, I felt something when you put that one here. <laughs> that is the most interesting, um, interesting piece. So emotional side as well as a physical, like in, in your own body or or observing them or, or a little bit of both? In both. Mm. So in, in play in same way as in EMDR, but I don't think we speak about it that much. And that's what attunement at its core is, is that work of the transference and then mm -hmm. counter transference, being able to verbalize the felt sense. Wow. Wow. Which could, could bring up, I mean, miniatures are so like the metaphor can bring up so many things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you may be, I may be interrupting you. So you could tell it's me. Okay. I, I can go with this. I love it. <laughs> so as far as like, um, you mentioned like starting off client centered. I love that. Like what that builds that trust and that deep connection of like, I'm not I'm being asked to be any different than I am right now. What would be some directives or approaches in the sand trade? Just to even start off with say like phase one or phase two that you use. So one of the things that I do at the very beginning, so I might stay away from figures to begin with. Because part of going through the process is being able to be able to find out if that client can even withstand this medium. So, you know, if somebody has visual difficulties or tactile issues, or I don't know, they, they might not even like the color. Oh, like it's trigger or sensory wise or okay. Mm -hmm. So it could be very subconscious. 
Mm-hmm. So we need we need to be aware of that, you know, and that and that's our that's our part of being the therapist. But it's in kind of like Anna was saying with the with the butterfly, like we want to make we want to have like this awareness that it could trigger just the actual uh, materials that we use could trigger them. Of course, in the same way, like you said, you have that response to this figure. So you know, one of the goals of the sand tray is to have the containment. So I've been known to do what I consider sand tray work away from the tray. So I might just do it on the tabletop and use the tabletop as the containment to keep that space. Oh. Right? So the idea though of being present and being able to have that containment and that co-regulation is so important. But exactly like you were saying, so in phase two, as we're developing resources, being able to say, okay, understand the felt self, felt, felt sense, this mm-hmm. figure, versus maybe this figure of these two together. Yeah. And then as you process it, and processing is very important also, and how we process. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the differences is we like to stay away from questions. Yeah. And go directly to statements. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying something like, oh, what does this figure, oh, I'll go to this one so you can see my hand. It's like, what does this figure mean to you? We might say something similar to, I'm curious about this area. Oh, okay. And just to bring their attention. It sounds gentle. It is gentle, and hopefully it's, you know, it's able to allow their body and their mind to stay in the lower levels instead of being conscious and aware. Oh, okay. So from a neuroscience perspective, it's really allowing them to kind of be where they need to be with the processing without trying to like answer your questions. I think about like even people that get in these people pleasing modes that could mm-hmm. take them totally out of the processing and, and worry about like, is he satisfied with my answer? Right. And there's no satisfying me. It's just being present with them. Oh, I love it. And as we see that activation, then we can actually step, especially if we've done a really solid phase two, phase one, then we can step directly into phase three. Mm-hmm. And when, when I'm talking, when I think about littles or I think about sand tray, I'm always trying to bring in a strong support system. Just like Anna was saying, how do we incorporate the parents? How do we make sure they have the skills that as this person becomes dysregulated because they might put this tray together and then two hours later, especially in adults, find out, wow, I didn't know that's what I was saying. Oh, some awareness. Um, Waldo, uh, Lydia says, what if the client wants you to participate in the tray like they asked you to put in their miniature in an exact spot? What would you respond with? Well, it, it would depend, right? So even though I said there's rules, this is just what we're trying to do to be present. Mm-hmm. So if I find out that the client is needing me to do it, yeah, right? Now, all of a sudden, I view myself as part of the tray. I'm not doing it. Mm I am being an instrument to allow this person to place what they need to place. Okay, so you're, you're still their autonomy. They're directing you. So it's not like you're making decisions. You're just an extension of what they want to happen in there. Mm-hmm. And there's some sanctuary therapists that would that would that would kind of freak them out. Be like, no, never. <laughs> but but I don't want that that person's inability to touch this figure because that figure is so activated. Yeah. To not allow their process to move forward. Oh, you make a good point that the, these figures can really like push the nervous system to the max just through the imagery, mm-hmm. but that makes it tolerable. Well, that seems like 
kind of like um, the concept of like an external regulator, like you, there's safety in me. I can hold what you can't necessarily hold in this moment. Right, exactly. And so being able to have that and then to be even one step further away, same as you and Anna were talking about having the movement. Yeah. Sometimes being able to stand up, walk to a shelf, pick another figure and come back. I've watched people do that and trash total trays. Like, oh, I know you wanted me to help you work with the safe place. Then they come back and they take all these out. And they're like, oh no, my psyche wants us to work about the bills I just got. Oh. <laughs> because that's what's in me now. I just got activated just, you know, <laughs> right there in the middle. It, would that be, I guess it's whatever it is with that client, but I'm thinking that's part of their presentation. Like either they're, they're moving in EMDR when we think like one thing. Exactly. Ah, shifting, like going mm -hmm. through the memory network. Correct. So as we're working through it, it's like, oh, well, that's not a hot spot anymore. This ah. is where it's at now. Oh, so allowing for that adaptive shift. Mm hmm and you, and sometimes you'll see it and it's like, wow, did that just happen? But us being able to be present and just because somebody's working on a tray, that doesn't mean that it's time for us to work on our notes. That's not time for us to check our cell phones. That's not time for us to go get a drink. Yeah. Because that, that dysregulation, that idea of the psyche becoming invoked can happen at any time. And our ability to hold and be present is our job. Oh. And, that's, and that's what we're doing with our inner weaves. That's what we're doing when we ask somebody, all right, you're doing great. Let's keep at it. We're letting them know that we're with them. Yeah. Goodness, I think too, like um, if, if someone didn't have that, kind of understanding they may see as like, oh, they abandoned the target. They mm -hmm. abandoned what they were working on. Now they're talking about their bills, but really it's just like they're just like if we were just to use words and you just ping pong all around your life. That's just an, an example of that. Mm -hmm. And the bills might have gotten so big in the moment, right? Because it's not, it's not our felt, you know, it's not our feeling about it. Yeah that can now be the biggest thing in their world. Because if their bills now are threatening their livelihood, threatening their housing, threatening where they're at, that might be where, where we need to reprocess a little bit right now to be able to clear that up, to go back to the, the larger or underlying issue. Oh, I love it. Now, I know you have like the light bar right there in your sand tray room. You do mm -hmm. you do several um, uh, mechanisms of action for the uh, bilateral stimulation. Is that something where like when you see the movement there, you would actually start another set where you'd say, let's tap that through or notice that or go with that? Exactly. You know, and that's actually a tip that I got from Anna in um, one of your master classes. And I, I don't know this if you know this, but you and I have spent so much time together, but it's mostly just been me spending time with you, not the other way around. <laughs> well, we have to spend time together, really. <laughs> um, my mind was blown. Um, I, I think it was at the Santre uh, master class where you had the light bar like right here over the tray. And I was like, what? Next thing you know, I'm like packing my light bar up to my wall. And I'm like, this is where this little one goes now. And my wife, who's also a clinician, is like, why is this in here? I'm like, I'll show you later. <laughs> but, but you're exactly right, Jackie. Um, we do tons and tons and tons of different BLSs. Um, I've seen people do everything from where we might just tap on the side of the tray mm -hmm. i've seen where people will use of course the portable tappers um in my opinion it's i mean i remember in the early days where people thought hey let's just get the kids we'll put the tappers in their pockets and we'll just follow them around 
Like, yes. Yeah, but, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, but where's your intention? Where's your memory network? Where? What are you holding? So we need to be purposeful because they need to be able to put those pieces together for us to be able to, to move and shift. It's powerful um, when you move for, that's actually when I was first trained, I was told that and I thought, I went to this big comprehensive fancy training just to like put the buzzers in their pockets. But it's amazing when you work with intention, how powerful it can be. Um, Waldo, Patricia asked, uh, have you had a child insist on you doing a sand tray at the same time as them? And how would you handle that request? Oh, that's a hard one, right? So now all of a sudden, it's the same way I view that like when we're in grad school, which yeah. some of us was, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And, and the clients are like, but I want to do this. Why aren't you doing this? We see okay. that a lot also in play, right? I'm playing. Why aren't you playing? Oh, kind of like now, a vulnerability, like I'm the only one being exposed. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of ways you can go about it. One, of course, in this room, we only have one tray, but in most of our rooms, we have several trays. I don't like to do that because yeah. I can't co-regulate. Yeah. So... I might even say, wow, that sounds like something that's activated in you. Mm -hmm. And then allow them to go with it. Okay. Oh, you're curious of what my role is. Oh. So be, being able to have those reflections in the moment, say, oh, this is something you don't like, mm -hmm. or you're worried about me. Mm hmm. Goodness, as I even hear you say that, Waldo, and I hear your um um like your intonational voice, it's it sounds so safe. Like the whole co-regulation piece is so powerful with um being able to just kind of respond back to them and not have to have any answers per se or yes or no's. Yeah, because you know, because if that's what's activated in the moment, that's what we need to process. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't like all of the attention directly on you. Oh, mm -hmm. I felt that one too. So you use Santre, um, you integrate it throughout the entire process? I do. For my clients that are using Santre, um, EMDR has just become language, right? EMDR has just become the process. Mm -hmm. So as we're doing it, as I said, from our early days, we're setting up the idea of early targets. We're setting up the idea of early resources. I try to resource as much as I can, as frequently as I can. If I mm -hmm. see somebody and they're walking down the hall and we've worked in the past, so I know where they're at and I see them, I was like, what's going on? And I, oh, I just had lunch. I'm like, oh, tell me about it. They might say a little bit something. Oh, what's the feeling that goes with that? Where do you feel it in your body? All right, let's butterfly that in. Mm. Just right on the fly. But if you have the solid groundwork, phase one, phase two, yeah. then let's bring in phase three whenever we need it. If I see somebody halfway going through a tray and next thing you know, they're becoming dysregulated. Yeah. All right whoa, what's the, what's the negative cognition? And of course, with different ages, we're going to use different words. Yeah. You know, and we might go, oh, wow, what is that saying about you? What mm -hmm. would we rather that mean for you? Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm just, I'm thinking, I think you think got my mind spinning. <laughs> just keep on going. I don't want to limit you. And of course, you know, since, you know, I, I live in the world of play. I live in the world of props, you know, in play, we call them tools. Everybody else calls them toys. Mm -hmm. So I do lots of things. So like one of the things I've done is, you know, this is very similar. This isn't revolutionary. So like I might have, you know, this set chart printed out, laminated. We write on them. We draw on them. We use figures to just mark where we're at. And sometimes we can watch the shift. 
mm-hmm. as we're moving, you know, it's like, oh, wow, we were here. Okay, we're here. Uh-oh, we're back here because we're on a brand new target. Yeah. So being able to find the language that the children are using, find the language of developmentally what's appropriate for them is mm-hmm. so important. That's so good. Even just moving it is resourcing, like knowing that it's possible to shift and heal from this. I'm not stuck in this state. Um, things can change. They can get worse and get better. It's not like um, just stuck all the time. And um, for people who are thinking about going into the world of sand train and EMDR, please get trained. Yes. I think so many times people see the sand they see the figures and they don't understand that there's a model that goes with it. There's heritage that goes with it. There's history that goes with it. And our goal isn't just to be in there playing. Our goal is to be in there and exploring. Our Mm -hmm. goal is for the person to be in there to have the chance at integration. Yeah. Yes, the power of it too. I mean, it can go into spaces that are so very, I mean, healing, but as equally powerful to open up things if we um, don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Anything else before we um, move on to Marcella that you feel like is helpful? People are asking if you have any trainings. So we're working on putting some together. Of course, we do supervision. I am a consultant in training. Um, Normally, you can find us on our website. But as we started uh, putting the consultant on our website, they decided to take our whole site down as they built a whole new one. Thank goodness. Oh, (laughs) FYI, that was me being sarcastic. Um, But um, you can definitely find us on Facebook, Windborne Wellness and Counseling. You can always search Waldo Winborn. There's only two of us, me and my dad. So he'll definitely pass the information along. Um, but I want to tell everybody, if you're going to do sand tray, get trained. If okay. you don't have a wall of 150 beautiful figures, it doesn't matter. Because when you do it right, the psyche can turn this into a brick or it can turn this into my father. Oh, the psyche will label it to whatever it needs to be. There are some beautiful online tools. Oaklander has a free one that everybody can use. Um, Simply Sand Tray or Sand Play, I think it is. It's only $10 a month. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Marshall really got my eyes open to being able to use them more, especially for the people that I work with who have disabilities. Yes. I have clients that are, because of their trauma, of course, they've been able, they've gained weight. It's hard for them to get up and down out of the chair. Mm-hmm. What a way for them to be able to have access without the shelves becoming an issue. I love it. So accessibility, it's ethical. Mm-hmm. Oh, I so, love it. I love it. So I want to say thank you for the opportunity and just to make me a little bit on my cutting edge to talk about San Trey on Anna Gomez Day. (laughs) I I love it. And um, thank you, Waldo. And for um, anyone looking for trainings, well, well, Waldo, where you're getting yours like developed, I can't wait to take yours. Um, Anna Gomez has San Trey and EMDR training, of course. And Marshall Lyles has um, great um, EMDR um, San Trey trainings. And then getting it, trained in sand tray and integrating EMDR in your own can be pretty amazing as well. So just getting some training in sand tray is really helpful. Well, thank you so much, Waldo. And I love all the miniatures. I appreciate you. Waldo's, or, um, Waldo, you're getting a clap from Anna. <laughs> all right. Um, anything else before we um, move to Marcella, Waldo? I think we're all good. Um, Like I said, Waldo Winborn, winbornwc.com normally. Um, Just find me on Facebook. I'm pretty, I'm pretty around. And you're an EMDR consultant in training. So yes. All right. So Marcella, 
Marcel is somebody, you know, when you meet somebody, like immediately there's like this, like a, oh my goodness, this person is like, unlike anybody I ever met. I met her recently through the Innovative Child Therapy Symposium, and she is a guru. When it comes to adoption, specifically this topic of transracial adoption, and I think about working with children with EMDR throughout the phases, um, it's really, really helpful to know phrases and facts and commonalities and all kinds of stuff I don't even know to describe. So this is Marcella. She's um podcaster. She's the MDR consultant in training. No, I'm, I'm legit now, right? I'm a, I'm a consultant. I made it. <laughs> you made it. And she's a friend of Annie and Anne um, Beckley Forrest. So um, I'm going to stop talking, Marcella, and let you take it away. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate it. Um, uh, like Jackie said, there, there are so many nuances, right, when we're talking about adoption cases in general, and then when we're adding, you know, the transracial piece on top of it, it just makes things a little, a little bit messier. And this is a topic that, you know, I've chatted with Jackie about. This is near and dear to my heart because I am a transracial adoptee, transnational adoptee from, from Colombia. So Anna, if you're still here, I get the busy mind thing. It, it has to be a Colombia thing because I'm I'm the same way. Um, so that is something that makes this even more personal for me because there is a lot of gaps in terms of care, in terms of people's knowledge of adoption and all of the you know trauma that it is rooted in. And also when we're applying EMDR, a lot of times there can be additional harm that is done, especially if we're moving things that are just too fast. Um, so one of the things that I, I'm always really, um, uh, you know, intentional about is when you are having a new client come in, it's really, really important that, you know, you are getting a really, really thorough history, right? So that is if it's just from adoptive parents, if that, you know, if biological family is able to be a part of that, if there are other caseworkers, if this was a kiddo that was in the foster care system, getting as clear of a picture as you possibly can, because a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is potentially stuff that they have just totally dissociated from or stuff that they don't have any explicit memory of. And I'm always very careful with, you know, for us as clinicians, we, we really do need to have a lot of those details in order to formulate target lists. But where we have to be really careful is a lot of times the client themselves doesn't know this information, right? If they, you know, were conceived through, you know, a sexual assault, if they had drugs them when they were born, if there was any kind of like abuse or neglect that was happening throughout the pregnancy or in those very, very early years, right? So when I'm thinking about transracial adoption, it's we have to start with the adoption piece, right? Because the racial trauma and all of those things compound this, this big, huge wound that's already there. And if we're not kind of getting to the core of that first and kind of understanding what that really, really early life looks like, we're inevitably going to be missing, missing some really key pieces. Um, but a big part of that for, for me just at, as an adoptee and something that I think that a lot of clinicians don't necessarily think about is this is stuff that it, it's, it's this really fine line of we really shouldn't know a whole lot of things before the child knows because this is their story, right? This is their story. This is their narrative. So we want to be able to, as we get some of this information, be letting parents, guardians, whoever know this is stuff that sooner rather than later, we're going to have to talk about. We're going to have to share that this information happened in an age appropriate, developmentally appropriate way. So that's something that's really important in terms of history taken. Marcella, one thing that's coming to mind as you say this um, is sometimes families have secrets. I don't know if anyone ever uh, yeah, and likely a lot of people, if we're EMDR therapists, we stumble on, oh, they don't know that they're adopted or they don't know that they were conceived from sexual assault or they don't know that they have siblings that, that are in their same class at school. How yeah. do you navigate that in the history taken in EMDR? Yeah, so I, it's a lot of psychoeducation, right? Most of the time, the reason that parents haven't told is either because they don't know how to, right? Like they don't know how to say that in a way that's appropriate. And it's out of protection, right? I don't want to cause my child who's already gone through all of these things 
any more pain, any more trauma, right? Like it is coming from a good place. So it's having to have a lot of psychoeducation for those parents and those families of the, this kiddo already knows this, right? Because they lived it, right? What, what really stinks for them is that they're having to go around oftentimes without words to describe what happened. So they kind of go into this tailspin, right? It's the big feeling is there, the body sensation is there, but they have no words to be able to bring that distress down. And that is something that we want to empower adoptive parents or, you know, bio parents if they're involved to be able to share so that they have some words for that. And that's usually a first step. I call it in my practice, like we have an information sharing session. So I will literally work with parents on creating a script of this is how we're going to tell this client this in a way that is developmentally appropriate. And that's happening before we're even going through any like formal reprocessing. Goodness, that makes me think of like, phase two is like creating um, this therapeutic relationship and um, this um, connection and resourcing and that right there with parents, with when we're working with kids, doing that with parents is as important, if not more. And sometimes that even just hearing you describe that, I felt like a sense of peace, like there's actually a process. I don't have to be like scared that I'm going to mess my kid up even more. It's, that's, that's kind of the phrasing that I've I've heard. Yeah, parents need equal support through that process, right? Because they're panicking, they're worried, they're like, oh my gosh, this is going to like make my kid totally lose it. And actually, in, in my experience, it's this really beautiful experience of the parents are sharing something that's really hard. And absolutely, everybody's going to have feelings about it, but being able to do it in a way that is incorporating, you know, attachment focused things, I'll often have, you know, parent will make a fort together and everybody will be in the fort when we share this news, we'll have snacks or be able to do some kind of like more therapy based stuff so that this is something that yes, we had to address really, really hard stuff, but then we're able to resource the fact that this is a family that got through hard things together. This is a family that's not afraid to talk about things that are really hard, but also really relevant. And that also serves us in terms of adoption and the transracial piece, because these are topics that a lot of families don't know how to discuss, don't want to discuss. Typically, you know, transracial adoptees have, have a history of being very silenced when we speak out about these things. We're seeing it right now with, with Colin Kaepernick kind of calling some of this stuff to attention. And we want to be able to set the tone that these are things that are safe and okay to talk about in, in this unit. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So many things come to mind. Like, Okay, so you're in like a fort made out of like blankets in your office for the. Well, I have an actual tent. Sometimes I will have that, you know, especially if the kiddo needs to kind of move, we'll have that be part of the process. And, you know, in my in my office, we call it like, we're going to make a hard feelings tent, right? So this is a place where we can go, where we can talk about hard stuff, but it's contained. We can still have things that make us feel really cozy and really safe. And what's really interesting is then once that happens, I have kids that will be, I need my hard feelings tent, right? It's like we're putting it out there like there is a space where we can talk about that. And once that's on the radar for kids, they use that as a resource. Or I've had parents that is like we created our own hard feelings tent at home. And that's something that we can kind of utilize for kids that are a little older. Maybe it's not an actual tent, but it's, you know, you can create a space where anything goes and everything is, you know, on, on the table. Oh my goodness, Marcel, that is literally beautiful. That's like a safe space that's very tangible. That's right there. And if they have it at home, that's like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. And I think about too, like culturally, transracial adoption. Sometimes there's this kind of like, I don't know what it's like to be you. So for me to give you any advice feels or on the on the opposite, you know, um, receiving is like, how dare you say that you don't know what it's like to be me. Does that come up in your experience? Like when you're in the kind of yeah. this hard feelings place? And how do you address it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that is a huge one. Most of the transracial adoptees that I work with, they are, um, you know, children that have been adopted into white families, right? So that is like its own, you know, stuff going on different levels of privilege, you know, the world just sees us very, very differently, all of these different nuances. And it's having to have a lot of those tough conversations with 
parents of like this stuff is going to come up, right? And you want to be in an empowered enough position that when it does come up, your kid is going to come to you and not see you as an additional threat, right? And for even some situations, when I have a client that, yes, I'm, I'm a transracial adoptee, but I might not be of the same culture. I might not be from the same country, right? But I can still offer a, oh my gosh, like that has to be really, really hard, right? Or I can still offer that validation and that, you know what? I don't understand exactly what that's like, but I trust that what you're telling me is the truth on this, right? Like this is something where we're not gonna get into debates and we have to kind of coach parents through that because they are never going to know. And that's the reality. It doesn't mean that they can't keep learning Learning and they should be continuing to learn, but it has to be this, this acknowledgement of you walk through this world differently than I do. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you're an EMDR consultant. So if, uh, you know, people can reach out to you for individual consultation, do you have, um, like you have a certification groups or individual, or what do you have like in terms of uh, if people want to learn more from you? Yeah, so I do have consultation groups that run. Um, it's for people that are EFDR trained or certified or even not just like, you know, adoption, like I said, is very, very nuanced. So there's lots of things that come up. So I have those groups running. Um, I do offer individual consultation. Um, and then on the parent end, I, um, you know, run virtual support groups for parents to kind of like talk about some of these really, really hard topics and at least help to give um, some jumping off points. And then as you mentioned, um, fellow transracial adoptee and EMDR clinician, Amy Wilkerson and I, um, we co-host the podcast Adoptees Dish, where we, you know, kind of dive into things from that personal lens, but also the clinical professional lens. I love it. I love it. So many resources. Um, in terms of like targets that are calm, and I know everybody has their own experience. So even asking this question, I'm recognizing that could be very kind of insensitive to everybody's kind of unique experience as a human being. But are there some common um, targets that come up with transracial adoptee clients that um, there are themes that you see that aren't present in clients that aren't? Yeah. So like I said, you know, typically what we want to try and do is address that you know, relinquishment, attachment wound first, right? Because usually the race stuff comes later and just like amplifies if we haven't addressed that original problem. Um, so I think I'm able to share my screen here, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me get this up here. So I created, and obviously, like you said, Jackie, we have to be, you know, aware and, and respectful of the fact that like not everybody's story is the same, but we know that when, you know, an adoption is happening, that that is something that's rooted in trauma. There is a traumatic, you know, thing that had to happen in order for that adoption to even be taking place. So I created kind of this sheet and I think it'll go out in, in the workbook with everybody, just potential targets that even if number one, the adoptee is not readily sharing this stuff, even if it's stuff that, you know, you're just trying to gain more information in terms of your assessment with the adoptive parents and getting history taking, these are some things that you're always gonna want to be really, really curious about because this is stuff that if an adoption is going on, this is stuff that is likely going to be on the radar. So things like if there was any in utero trauma, you know, the nature of the conception, just the, you know, if if the the there were any complications during like labor and delivery. And then obviously for, for all adoptees, it's that, you know, moment or instance of separation, whatever that needed to look like, right? So then when we get to, and there's kind of more and more and more, um, but then when we get to things that are, you know, kind of in the more transracial, transnational things, we have to be aware of all of these added things. Like we're not only losing access to biological family, but losing, you know, birth country, having to leave birth country at whatever age, the loss of culture, the loss of language, having all of these questions about family, looking at family photos of you and your adoptive family and being able to very clearly see that you are different in some way. Um, a lot of adoptees go into families that, you know, have their own, you know, racial biases or, you know, microaggressions, and that's something that they are continually and chronically exposed to, um, you know, going through life with lack of genetic mirrors, racial mirrors, cultural mirrors, um, you know, societal collective trauma, you know, in, in the city of Buffalo, where when we had the, the horrible shooting at, at, at Tops, 
every single one of my transracial adoptees that was, you know, black had stuff to say about that. That was stuff that was literally, you know, like life or death there, you know, systems had been activated. Um, and then kind of going on some of this too, if at any point they are going to be traveling back to birth country, place of birth, if they were, you know, felt any sense of rejection from their birth country or birth culture. These are some of those secondary wounds that we talk about and secondary rejections that can be just as, you know, poignant as some of those original traumas. Whoa, girl, that's a lot. <laughs> I know we got a lot to unpack. We really have a lot to unpack, we adoptees. <laughs> Just even seeing you change the page to page, there's like three pages, mm -hmm. I like felt tears well up in my eyes thinking about like trauma is intense, but the nature of just kind of the unknown and um, I'm trying to kind of wrap my mind around what maybe would be some of the common negative cognitions. Maybe I'm mm -hmm. different. I don't belong. I'm not worthy. I don't matter. I'm mm -hmm. defective. I'm painful. Yeah. Stuff. What are the ones that we, if you were to look at maybe some of the common negative cognitions, what do you see yeah. the most of? Um, what I see a lot, I think it, some of it depends on the age of the client. When I see, you know, little itty bitties, usually it's something just so basic that goes along with their stage of development of just like, it's I'm bad, right? I'm, I'm bad, right? Or I'm wrong or like something that's just really, really basic, but sums all of these things up. As I see kids get a little bit older, I see a lot of things like I have no control. I can't handle this this is just too much. Um, I, I'm, I'm only deserving of bad things, right? All of these things that kind of advance a little bit as they get older. And so a lot of times it's having to, you know, really redirect it to the most basic cognition. Another one that's really big that is kind of at every age group is just the fundamental, like I'm, I'm not safe. It's, it's not safe. And I, I can't trust. Ooh, I didn't even think about that one because if um, there is like um, just even uh, culturally like looking at like mm -hmm. intergenerational trauma, there's some activation even in the the cellular like in in if that yeah. who um, is in your family, there could be some work in that realm as well. So as right. far as like the actual practical application of EMDR. Um, like, it sounds like you're doing lots of family work and also individual work. So are you doing like um, family sessions and then individual or just kind of customizing it to each client? I, I'm definitely a customizer. I think that you have to be because every case is just so nuanced. You know, everybody's kind of at different points. Ideally, if family can be incorporated, that's that's amazing because it's a way to, again, have them, them holding space, having them be there as forms of attachment. Um, I have had cases where it's like really an amazing thing, especially with open adoptions, right? Like, you know, members of biological family can come and actually be there and they can kind of be everybody that loves and cares about this, this client can be there to support through that process. Um, I have done little bits of like group EMDR, especially for, you know, birth, birth mother and, um, you know, child, because they obviously went through that situation um, together. Um, but there are some cases where it is not, you know, in my clinical opinion, a safe thing for adoptees and, you know, adoptive parents to be in the same space. And a lot of times what we have to be aware of is there's this big loyalty bind, right? Of like, well, I don't want to say anything that's going to make, you know, my adoptive parents upset. I don't want to say anything that's going to make them mad at me, right? Like that is like the biggest, biggest fear of, oh my gosh, I've already lost big, huge connections. I can't risk losing this. So I'm only going to give you like little teeny things that maybe don't actually get to the nitty gritty of what's going on inside. So it's a lot of having to coach and prep on the front end to make sure that that client isn't, um, you know, falling into kind of some of that people pleasing, just like fawning, because then we're not going to get um, as much of that stuff digested and processed as we need to. Oh, sounds like secondary gain. Like I'm, I need to stay where I'm at or else I'm going to hurt some people that I feel very right. loyal to. I, if, if I show any kind of like healing or affection towards yeah. this person, it's going to hurt this other person. 
And, yeah. and sometimes we can't rush into that, that, right? Because a, a lot of times people that come in to see me, right? This is the first time that clients are even being able to have a space where this is even being identified as trauma, right? Like, you know, a lot of parents come in and they're like, we, we don't talk about this as trauma. We don't really talk about this as a hard thing. It's, you know, kind of the societal narrative of you're here now and we love you and everything's good. And this is a fairy tale. So there has to be so much front loading in terms of, no, this is a really hard thing. And oh my gosh, like little you had to go through so much and that must've been so hard. Like we have to attune to that fact before we're jumping into any, excuse me, kind of, you know, active reprocessing because this is this is new information. This is ways that they may have never even viewed themselves, viewed their stories before. Wow, wow. I think about too, um, like pictures, um, like the, the, just allowing them to bring in like, um, pictures from when they were young, that's helpful too. What are some ways that you invite them to share their story? Mm -hmm. Like, are, are there it, things? Yeah. I mean, it, it's wonderful when that's an option. I think we also have to be careful about that because even that, right. Lots of people don't think about it, but it's a trigger. Like I have no pictures of myself from my first, like six, you know, however many weeks of life, like I have nothing, right? So lots of other people don't have that for even longer, right? Especially if they lost that information, they were shuffled between foster homes and lost it. So that's something that even in and of itself is a, well, I'm different. My friends at school all have pictures of like the moment that they like came into the world and I don't have those things. And so when pictures aren't available, I always, you know, am very, you know, whether it's in the sand tray, whether it's, you know, them drawing, whether it's using different kind of props, it's like, what do you think it was like? What do you think it was like, right? Like I'll always say, you know, after we've kind of done some of this prep work, like, what do you think that you looked like as a baby in a belly? Like, what do you think that you looked like when you were growing bigger and stronger inside of, you know, birth mom or however they refer to her as, right? And a lot of times, you know, these, these kids will get a sense of like, you know, that the baby will be crying or the baby will be like screaming or like the baby will have this like really confused, scared face on and all of those kinds of things. So it's, you know, that they know like their systems embody those things. And so we don't have to necessarily rely on pictures, but when, when we do have them, absolutely, that's something that can be, um, you know, resourced in or, you know, used in, in treatment. That's so good. I think about like having them kind of imagine it. That's in the safety of relationship with you. So yeah. that in itself could be very powerful. Yeah. Now we only have a few more minutes, but Adriana had a question. Um, and also let's see, um, uh, Singa said, as a psychodynamic therapist, I'm absolutely loving this. Nada said, the tent idea is great. I'm going to use it for kids who, with parents that have died by suicide. Um, Adriana said, are there any resourcing that you teach that is specific to adoption trauma? Meaning if you have a transracial adopted client that when they're dysregulated, they regress back to toddler age behavior, temper tantrums, flailing arms, um, crying, um, teenage years, and emotional outbursts that likely yes. stems from the trauma. All, all the time, right? Like I have, you know, 14, 15 year old clients that have a, a baby part, a much, much littler part of them. Um, you know, especially for my clients that had to, you know, separate under really traumatic circumstances, any of my adoptees that had to, you know, go through institutionalized care, dissociation is one of their best friends, right? They are, you know, some of the most highly dissociative clients out there. And that oftentimes is not what's on the radar. Other, something else is, you know, thrown at them in terms of a diagnosis and all of these other things. So absolutely, um, you know, this, this is a population where you have to be really aware that there are protective parts involved. There are going to be high levels of dissociation and that teeny tiny little things that we wouldn't even register as a threat, their systems perceive as a threat, especially when it comes to relationships and connections. Oh, I love it. I love it. So, so very much like being curious about this person's experience. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marcella. And um, if you could just, can you say yeah, the um, website name for, um, we're going to have all of it in the workbook and the workbook is created but I couldn't upload it to my site. And then I, cause I can't log it. There's tech issues. So I need to email it. So within like 24 to 48 hours, you're going to have it. But Marcella, if you could just mention your website name. 
Yeah, so my website, I keep it really, really easy. Instagram, everything is all the same. It's just MarcellaMoslow.com. If you're on Instagram, it's at Marcella Maslo, um, you know, Marcella Maslow at gmail.com. Um, and then the podcast is called Adoptees Dish, and that is available on Spotify right now. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And for um, those of you that um, haven't um, joined the EMDR community, I think you have because you have the link. You must be in the EMDR community. Definitely stay in there and um, and um, gather as many resources. Roach and Brayer puts out a lot of great information. Marcella is an amazing person to consult with. Waldo is an amazing person. Ana Gomez, I don't know if she does consultations, but she would be amazing if she does. <laughs> um, all three of these people are like near and dear to my heart and professionally like a gift to our um, whole EMDR with kids field. Um, thank you, Marcella. Thank you, Waldo and Ana, if you're still in here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we'll have the next one in May. We don't have a date and you will have the workbook in the community. You'll be notified through there. Um when I figure out how to get it, it's kind of large, get it loaded up. All right. Take care. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.